Um, it's time now to introduce the keynote panel, which is based on the theme Generation Tech and, of course, its impact for the global economy, which, as you as well know by now, is the theme of the conference this year. So I would like to invite upon the stage, uh, coming from both stairs, first of all, Ulf Ibbelson, who is the Chief Technology Officer of Ericsson. Thank you very much. If I could just ask you to take your seats on the sofas. Thank you, Nina. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks. Also delighted to be joined by Fazana Huck, who's the head of Europe Telecommunications Business and Global Head of Strategic Group Accounts at Tata Consultancy, who's over there, as you can see there. Hussein Kanji needs little introduction in technology sectors here of Hoxton Ventures. Great to see you again. And uh, last but not least, Urs Horner, who is the chairman of Credit Suisse Group, who's also on our panel today. My compliments for the music, very tech. In my day, tech meant something completely different. <laughs> and it was musical, tech music. Um, so we're here to talk about um, how this hyper-connected world changes the environment for people and all of you business leaders out there, whether you're, for instance, an investor like Hussein Kanji, whether uh, obviously a company like Ericsson has been spearheading uh, networks for technology for years. If you're in banking as well, the tech world really changes customer expectations. And also um, for Tata Consultancy, India is a huge tech market too as well. Let's start out with you, Urs Rohner. Um, tech and banking, particularly Switzerland, which is known for tradition. How do you marry the tradition and the technology without alienating people? I think you know, when you ask a question like this, originally or, or the first instance, it's a challenge. It's a huge challenge, not just for Swiss banks, I think for all the banks globally. And the basic proposition I'll make is that so far the financial services industry has not only, not even scratched the surface really on this, because will, there will be a fundamental change the way the financial services industry will work, will have to work as a result of the technology, the technological development we have seen give you one example, and it actually it spreads out to all the businesses in banking, but take the, I would say the, the most fundamental Swiss banking business, private banking or wealth management business. Um, our clients, as a result of the technology, uh, technological development, will become more knowledgeable. They will, will, get, will have access to more information at a shorter period of time, at no cost. So the ultimate thing you have to ask yourself, and, and actually people grow up differently, so they will have certain expectations to what the bank should do and how it's, how it's being done and what they expect from a bank. And in turn, they will ask some basic questions like, why should I pay you 120 basis points for your services if 80% of the hard information that I need, I can get uh, online for free? So what do you say to them? I would say to them that you know, it's not only about the whole information, it's about, uh, it's, it's about a mix of, of what your business model is all about. I think that trust, the trust uh, element in a banking relationship and the possibility to apply judgment as to what you do with billions of, uh, of uh, in, uh, data and information is what ultimately is your business model so, so that you can be a proper advisor to clients that's what they will, I'm sure, also in the future, will all prepared to pay for. But it means you have to change completely your procedures, probably also the way that clients interact with you. My kids will never go to a bank branch anymore. Um, they will all do online. And this is not just about payment services. It's also at the higher end of, of wealth management business. You will have to be able to allow your, even your top clients to apply sophisticated technology to do 80% maybe of what they want to do themselves and the rest, they have access to, to relationship managers to get in-depth analysis information at any time they want it. So do I get the sense that business is getting quite a bit harder? Because whichever part of Credit Suisse you're talking about, from investment banking right to the client, uh, wealth services, it is getting more difficult. The margins just aren't there anymore. Because on it's on the one hand, yes, there is obviously margin compression if that works. Um, and on the other hand, it's also clear that, you know, the technology will empower you to reduce your costs. And at the same time, I, I view it as a huge opportunity. If you get that right, if you truly understand 
what your clients want. And I, as I said, I mean, um, I, don't, I don't think the financial services industry really has spent enough time and analysis into finding out what the clients and the future clients may want. But if you get that right, I mean, your potential to, to, to basically grow in new markets is enormous. So I, net net, I view it as a fantastic opportunity, even though in the interim you will have to make a lot of adjustments and the industry so far has not been very fast in actually doing that. As, as Chief Technology Officer for Ericsson, what do your clients want these days? How has it changed? I think very big change. Obviously, when we launched mobile telephony in 1980, it was something for a very narrow group of people. It was specific networks, and the revenues were huge, and they were all voice-based. And today, we're in totally data-centric networks where the, most of the revenue, hopefully, will come from the data world as the costs lie there. So they are inlining their revenue models with our cost models. And I think for us, the challenge is to keep up with Moore's law when it comes to technology, of course, to continuously be able to process much more data in the networks, but at the same time also be part of their change of their business models, supplying services and stuff that makes it easier for them, analytics technology, these kind of technologies. How can a big company like yours stay relevant and stay flexible? Right, I was thinking about that when I heard the previous speaker here from IDEA, and you also commented on how he looks. I mean, it is, it, it, we have to keep a startup um, mentality also as a large company. And of course, we do a lot of young hires uh, in Ericsson Research, which is the research arm of our company, about a thousand people. The, the average age is, is lower than 30. So it is important for us to completely refresh ourselves continuously. That's quite difficult, though, keeping that startup mentality. It can be quite risky as a strategy, can't it? Because you also have shareholders who want to see things done by the book. It's a very good point, Nina, because not everything is about innovation at the moment and so on. You need to have long-term views on technology as well. Some of these platforms that we are enjoying today, 4G, the LTE evolution, it was mentioned here earlier that we are look, working now on much higher speed LTE coming out to make uh, mobile broadband and the services from the banks more safe and secure and better and faster and so on. Those technology investments are five to ten year investments. So they do require a more, if you will, stable investment environment, not so much total disruption internally, rather understanding and predicting the future fairly well. Fazan Haq, um, you're obviously the head of Europe for the telecommunications and business unit for Tata Consultancy, but obviously Tata is such a huge and successful Indian conglomerate, and IT has been a game changer for India as well. There are lessons that we can learn over here from that sort of youthful spirit that you're managing to implement in Europe. Absolutely, Nina. Uh, you know, Tata is one of the oldest groups out of India. They bought in industrialization and now technology and stuff. Um, it's a global group, you know. Incidentally, it's based out of India, but it's a global group, especially for TCS, which I represent. Um, all our revenues come from the West, you know. India just happens to be headquartered. And what technology has done uh, for us specifically is enabled us to improve and leverage productivity of 300,000 employees that we have today. So, you know, if I can claim to be Generation Y in the group, uh, it's a very different way we work. Today it's a paperless office. Today we are able to track customers across the group, whether it is Credit Suisse or Oops Ericsson or Telenor, and you know, these are groups that we work with at a large scale. And to, even to find a small solution for, let's say, him in Ericsson, I can today take ideas and innovation from the 300,000 employee base that I have. I don't necessarily need to look at only the people working for his account. Uh, it has also changed India as a country. You know, it has suddenly given rise and mobilized middle class in India. It has given job opportunity to 300,000 people. You know, we started the company in 68, and uh, you see where we are today, the most admired group, company, all those laurels are there, but that has only happened because today you are able to leverage technology well. Uh, we have absolutely no paperwork. Everything is automated for us. Uh, crowdsourcing at its best in our group works and right. So if I have, so if I'm coming here today, I'll post and say, you know, what are the ideas? I'll get like 20,000 people responding, say, why don't you say this? Why don't you say that? You know, why don't you discuss this idea? Uh, so you see the enablement of people's potential. I think that's the biggest. Uh, uh, you know, take away for us uh, if we look at it. 
But isn't it exhausting filtering all that out? Isn't that where a company like yours comes in to consult on that as well? Uh, you know what? We have, uh, we have processes and policies in place which enable at every level some amount of correct conversation rather than noise. And uh, we are at the vanguard and at the cutting edge of technology that is coming up with. So we have an internal social media for the group and for the company where you, know, you can post ideas on anything. You know, you, there will be a topic of the week. So innovation is not contained to a department. Innovation is across. Uh, we also incubate lots of startups, technology focused across the group, uh, across, across the globe that I'm a part of today. And you know, uh, Nina, when I see, I, I started 16 years back, and it's my first company, first job. Uh, I'm still the internet generation, but I went from Blackberry to smartphone, and that in itself was such a big change for someone like me. And I have never visited a branch. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's a different way of living and working today. And today, uh, the 300,000 employee base that I keep talking about is a mobile base, yeah. out of which only 30,000 would be in India. The rest across the group, whether it is Finland or South Africa or South America, everywhere in the world. Uh, to be able to get that workforce to contribute meaningfully and to be able to make one of the most profitable and largest market cap company in India today, in Asia today, uh, it's quite commendable. And everything is technology enabled for us. And that learning is what we also take to our customers. Especially in telecom, sorry, I'll take a minute here. Especially in telecom in Europe, in the last 10 years, there has been a huge amount of change. It's been a game changer from just a pipe providing connectivity to today being able to change, to be able to manage how people live their lives. So yeah. Telenor does everything, right? So from broadcast yeah. to you know, everything they do. I think we have, been, we have been partners with them in this change. You know, banking is still lots more to do, and yeah. he very rightly said lots to do. But telecom has completely revolutionized in Europe. You know, Nordics, UK, uh, the way they function today, the way what they imply yeah. to a consumer is very different from what it was 10 years back. And also what the consumer expects. Oh, we'll come to that in just a second. But I want to also ask Hussein here, who well, we've been leaving out of the conversation for a second, slightly because you're almost the odd one out here because you're on your own. You're an investor with your own company, although you have actually worked to some of the big names in the industry like Microsoft. This interconnected world enables companies like Microsoft to go from a garage to this gargantuan entity, but it also enables investors like you to cherry pick. Which way is better? Bigger? Smaller? I think, I think the truth is very few of us know. I, I think one thing in our industry is that this is an industry of constant experimentation, constant iteration. There are lots of new ideas cropping up. Almost everything that you know about startups at inception changes as they go one year or two years into the, into the business, that even the ones that you think got it right, and, and I can use WhatsApp as an example, you know, they started off doing something very differently before they actually came up with WhatsApp, which then is now bigger than I think almost all SMS traffic in the world combined, um, and got sold for, to Facebook for 19 billion. But you know, it started off doing something very, very different. So this is an industry where you're constantly trying things, constantly learning, I think the good news for us is the industry has gone much more global and has become much more open. So it's much easier to experiment today than it was even 10 years ago. 19 billion for WhatsApp. That is absolutely ludicrous, isn't it? Come on, you're, you're an investor who's looking for returns. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're Facebook and you have, an, and you have, an, you have a stock that can, that can purchase it um, and, and you want the WhatsApp guys to be on your, on, on your platform, you know, it's, it's a buying and selling marketplace, right? So we're here to talk about global tech. And we've had so much money funneling through into tech. Are we seeing another bubble, we're saying? Yeah, so I, I, I get into a lot of trouble because I, I think I'm one of the dissenting voices in my industry where I do think we're, we're in slightly euphoric markets, maybe more than slightly euphoric markets. You know, if we, if we rewound history to, to January, February, we saw the software as a service companies, uh, I pick this industry as one example. So these are the guys who are building cloud computing software. Um, you saw their multiples double, uh, sometimes even quadruple, uh, with no underlying change in their economics. The only change that you saw these companies do, which is they took a lot of their money that they're historically spending on marketing, and they doubled it to accelerate their growth rate. Uh, but it kind of has the, it, you can kind of almost calculate out the effect. And you saw valuations, like I said, double to quadruple in these companies with no underlying change. Uh, and then the market corrected it in, in March. Um, you saw the same exact thing happen in the security space. Uh, you, you see this as investors 
both in the public markets as well as in the private markets. And the private markets, ironically, sometimes lag the public markets. Uh, as, as sectors get interesting and sectors get hot, you see a bunch of money flow into that market to try and pick the winners, cherry pick the winners almost, and prices, asset prices then go up. Now, let me come to you as just not necessarily speaking from Credit Suisse, but just speaking as the chairman of a, an enormous company. When you see tech firms with 30 staff or something, or 80 staff being sold for $19 billion, you're at the helm of an enormous company with tens, if not hundreds of thousands of staff. Um, are you not worried about valuations in the tech sector getting a little bit overheated? Well, basically, I mean, I, I admire everybody who can create a company that has a uh, market value like the, the numbers you just mentioned. We just have to be realistic about it. Some of them may survive. They'll become really big companies, maybe, maybe around for a very long time, and others will disappear. We have seen that before. The generally, I mean, you always look at the underlying business model and the prospect of those companies. And what we do when I, when I look at, uh, at companies now, not as a, for investment purposes, but more also from the perspective as to what we need to actually advance our own case and our own business, we, look at, um, we also look at small companies and see how, to, how we can cooperate with them. Maybe I would not rule out that at some point you know, we, may, we may decide to invest in, in some of them at an early stage. Um, that may not be, even be companies with 30 people, maybe be companies with five people. I think the, what, is, what would be wrong for an industry like ours is if banks what, try to do everything themselves, which, what they, which is what they have been doing in the past, I think that, that, that's the road to, to nowhere. I think you have to, to see, you have to monitor the spectrum and you have to look at these companies, but you have to do it with a critical eye, of course. I'm talking about it from the context of the global economy here because traditional big businesses, like the ones many of you in this panel work for, employ a lot of people. They're labor heavy, they create jobs. Whereas this wonderful euphoria surrounding the technology world doesn't create as many jobs for the amount of cash that it brings in. Well, the is question that detrimental is, in the long term? Yeah, I mean, in, in a way that may be true to some extent, but over time I would, I would expect, because I mean, those high valuations are the result normally also of, you know, of, of, of an assessment of how, what the future will bring and how you can roll something out globally. That will also uh, result in, in more jobs uh, by necessity. It may, they, may not, they may not employ 250,000 people necessarily, but some of these companies might have a, a large number of, of, uh, of employees as well, and they may create spin-offs from that company, other people who will start their own companies. So I think you have to, we just have to get used to it. I mean, the, the original model that you, know, you create one company and you know, it grows, the, employee, the, the staff number goes up and up and up, may not be necessarily always the model of the future. I mean, if you talk about banking, I mean, we are around 50,000 people at the moment. I, I, have, I do not have a vision of having 150,000 people because I know the, the, the complexity level of managing a company yeah. of that size increases not linearly but exponentially. I mean, I think in a way technology will help you to take out some of the complexities if you apply it correctly. And there may be more companies and slightly smaller companies. I don't view that as negative. Okay, so Fazana, how are companies like yours advising companies like yeah. these big listed companies um, on the panel to embrace technology and make it work for them in a more efficient way. But bear in mind that also does away with the need for certain parts of the, the labor force. Uh, you know, when I started off saying, Nina, about our workforce and how, how we've managed that, uh, these are all 300,000 people working for the consumers, right, for our customers. And uh, we, you know, when I joined the company, we were $200 million, and today we're $14 billion or $15 billion uh, in terms of revenue. We have stayed relevant, and we have stayed very true to the various industries we work. So our domain knowledge, whether it is in banking or telecom or retail and every, you know, any vertical we pick up, is extremely uh, relevant. And it, these are people who have spent years in those industries. Then have, they have come, embraced technology, and now are helping the customers. So if I take an example for telecom companies in the Nordics, right? We have helped both at the capex and at the opex. And he will join me in adding uh, points to that. Uh, we have ensured that we create platforms for telco companies to be able to reduce at both ends, both the capex and opex. So the traditional way of working just with the CIO, CTO, 
is not where we are today. You know, we will work with the chief marketing officer and come up with analytics of you know, how he can look at the various consumers that they're working with. You know, I earlier heard uh, BT speak, and um, you know, we, were, we were a large partner in helping them get into the sports arena and see how they could, leave, you know, how they could use that as a different market and consumer base, right? So today, technology is an enabler to help you decentralize your business it also enables you to go and trace customers, and they could be in any markets. And as a company, as a service provider, TCS has enabled that for various brands. But do you find often that, that, that you have to do a lot of convincing with companies to try and, do they have to completely overhaul their thinking and strategy to embrace this? Absolutely. This? In fact, I'll give you an example. In 99, I was, uh, you know, I worked out of the US uh, for all my career. And the, uh, and the U.S., uh, you know, adoption of various changes rather than just looking at outsourcing as a cost was faster. And when I moved to Europe, I saw the reluctance on a large scale saying, you know, we will still look at India or Asia or technology as a cost derivative rather than an innovation, right? And in, I don't know, something happened five years back. And you had, a, you had seen Telenor going into the Asia market. It's a great story. I keep saying it because uh, I'm, I'm very proud of how they have, you know, they're one of the biggest players in uh, Asia today. You know, they've given the local guys a run for their money in terms of services and what they provide to the customer. Or Telia or Ericsson, you know, you take Nokia, you take any of the brands out of Europe today and they were the fastest and the most aggressive adopters of technology for innovation and for handling different business models. So traditionally, our company was known, or any of these IT companies were known only from a cost structure perspective. How do I get my cost down? Today, we are sitting on the table talking about innovation. We are talking about, I have a lot of time customers asking me, saying, Farzana, how are you managing your unit of, let's say, 100,000 people, you know, minus 60,000, and that's a huge cost for me. You know, how do I leverage? I don't want to make them redundant, but how do I retool, reskill them, and use them to front-end customer? So customer experience management is today everyone, every, every brand is talking about, right? Any touch point with a consumer. So what we have done successfully is create platforms uh, tools and enablers to shift the focus into different business model that even traditional brands do, whether yeah. it's a BT or a Tesco or a Marks and Spencer or a BA, right? Which requires these companies to be particularly sensitive to their hiring needs, the type of staff that they're bringing on board, et cetera, et cetera Also the acceptance them. of technology yeah. within Nina, because a lot of them would view, like let's take British Airways, they would view it as our jobs are getting redundant rather yeah. than saying this is innovation coming in, this is a better way to service our customers, this is a different way because the consumer has today changed. And plowing money into retraining is something Absolutely. that comes up time and again. Um, Ulf, you're part of this gargantuan food chain really, aren't you? You're providing the networks and then we have uh, the, the telecommunications companies um, dealing with the, the mobile phone companies, and then they deal with, they provide face, well, the, the yeah. platform for Facebook, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Where is this food chain going? How long is it going to get? Right. I mean, you know, this is more than we could ever have expected when we started in telecommunications uh, some 138 years ago. So it's a, long, it's a long history for our company in this. And now it's so that the whole society will be built on these networks. The networks will actually be the limiting factor mm -hmm. for new services being able to be launched. I mean, we, we just mentioned here banking services that need secure networks, the higher speeds, the uh, automotive sector that wants to be build connected cars and so forth. So in that sense, we have a very positive outlook on those networks and the meaning that they will have for society and for people and for businesses. Um, we, you mentioned here how much will be software as a service. About 30% of all software companies will be software as a service in 2020. An enormous change. Company after company is digitalizing. Um, during the last quarter, 65% of all mobile phones sold globally were smartphones. So this is a very, very big change. And that means that uh, in terms of startups like WhatsApp launching new services, on the innovation power that was mentioned here is really moving outside operator space and totally into the over-the-top space, transforming business after business. But if we don't have good enough networks, 
a lot of this stuff just won't happen. The reason why Netflix can really happen is because the networks are good enough. So in that terms, yeah. we, we are very in a good position to keep innovating around the network's capabilities and what they can provide in order for the world to continue to transform so the way as, it does. So as the chief technology officer for a massive company like yours, you obviously have to keep looking down the horizon and saying, this is what I'm focusing on, this is what I need to plan for next. What would be on your crystal ball? Well, I think, I mean, super important is what was already talked about, how the, the global innovation power and how to manage that in a good way. I think any executive that has my type of role today, you rely enormously much on your own people. <laughs> Uh, Ericsson has around 25,000 people in R&D, uh, and then we have our services arm, which is, is, is around 60, 65,000 people. So a lot of that innovation comes from there, but most of it comes from, from the global networks and from global, uh, global reach, uh, the type of collaborations that is happening here, uh, Global Leadership Summit. Obviously, these kind of things is which leaves you with impressions and understandings. We have a lot of uh, cooperation with, with venture companies who are keep scouting, looking for anything happening out there. It just has to be 30% internal, I would say, 30% out looking at, at events like this, uh, collaborations, and then perhaps the rest of the 30% on, on uh, processes and, and internal work as a CTO. So, Hussein, what's in your crystal ball? If you're putting your money where your mouth is, where would you put it? It's hard. I mean, it's hard to figure out where we, where we ought to invest. I think what we're seeing right now is there's a whole series of enabling platforms. Telephony is one of them. Uh, software as a service or cloud computing is another one. And you can build on top of these layers to build interesting companies. Um, you know, we've done a bunch of investments now in the security space. There's been a lot of, you know, you're starting to see a lot of media attention about very high profile sites or very high profile companies getting attacked. I think the pace of this is only going to increase. And I do think that our shields around these services are not as sophisticated as they need to be. And there needs to be a lot more, a lot more thought about the infrastructure layer here. And I think some of that thought is gonna be done by the larger incumbent players. And some of that thought is gonna be done by more dynamic, more nimble startup companies. Um, so we have an investment in, in that space. You know, we've looked at some of the things in the drone space. Um, you know, we've looked at alternatives in the food technology space. You know, there are folks now building substitute products out of out of uh, either uh, algae protein or or uh, or, uh, or pea protein uh, to build replacements for things like chicken. I mean, the world is the world is accelerating so much faster than it was 10 years ago. And it's very hard to have the foresight to know what's going to happen in five or 10 years, but you can have a pretty good read of what's going to happen maybe in one or two years. And that's where we spend most of our time thinking. And let's face it, because of the disruption that we've seen thanks to technology and innovation, the taboos have been well and truly lifted. Let's ask the audience what they think. Does anybody have a question here? I'm sure that uh, some of you have some burning questions on these subjects for our panel here. Um, could I ask you to raise your hand if you do have a question? Wait for the microphone to come. I can't see any at the moment. Ah, we do have one at the back there. Yes, that's right. If we could just have a microphone to the gentleman in the back with the glasses. Thanks. Hello. My question would be uh, relevant to most of the panel, in fact. The kind of technologies that we've been focusing on here are abstract or soft technologies. So we're focusing on software or big data or networking, and they're great enablers for all the other industries, be it banking, be it other sectors. But in terms of real manufacturing capabilities for industries, uh, sectors like aerospace, or sectors like food production, for example, what sort of technological innovations are the key stakeholders in industry looking at? And what kind of things are investors looking at in terms of next investment opportunities for technology enablers for manufacturing in aerospace sectors, for example? All right, let's, let's give that one to you, Hussein. So there's, there's probably not a lot. I mean, so as investors, at least as venture investors, we think a lot about capital efficiency of our companies, and we think a lot about the total paid-in capital that needs, to be, that, needs to be, that needs to be given to a company in order for it to succeed. The, the companies that succeed the fastest and do it with the least amount of capital, even if they go on to raise lots of rounds, are, are, are software companies. Uh, that's where you get the maximum kind of bang for the buck as an investor. So you don't tend to see a lot of venture folks spending a lot of time in very 
capital intensive industries like say aerospace, I think food production, nobody really understands right now how much of that is R&D versus things that can actually be applied and, and, and yield the return in, in, a, in a reasonable amount of time. We're long-term patient investors. Seven to 10 years is very normal for us, but seven to 10 years is not that much time for fundamental, uh, uh, for fundamental innovations. I, I think in the aerospace industry, the one person who's kind of shaking things up is Elon Musk, who founded Tesla, who's spending a lot of his own personal capital uh, building things in, in that space and kind of laying the foundation uh, for that industry to, to, to grow. And let's face it, you've got to have guts as well to put your money in, in, in the tech side of manufacturing when you could get such a big return in the soft technology side, right? I do, and I, I think it's interesting. The venture business is all about, to some degree, contrarian investing. Things that look obvious usually don't return all that much money, and there have been a bunch of studies internal inside of some several partnerships that I know where the most dissenting voices or the ones that, the, the companies that caused the most dissenting voices turned out to be some of the biggest outcomes for, for the industry. So, you know, in 2005, if you asked people about social media, I think most people would have rolled their eyes and said that there's no business there whatsoever, that you know, these things are never going to make money. You know, who's going to use this? It's just for college students. This is in the very early days of Facebook. And that entire industry has le yielded a ton of returns, whether it's Facebook or Zynga or King or, or Twitter. Um, you know, but these were very contrarian at the time in 2005. Um, you know, for all we know, aerospace investing might be the next big thing right now. Most of us are shying away from it for all the, uh, for all the reasons I explained, but it could actually turn out to be the one where there's the greatest innovation. This is an industry where you have to be humble. Uh, you, 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 you turn out to be wrong so much more than you turn out to be right. So when you are right, you really need to make it count. Sounds like a proper investor there. <laughs> Some wise words. Um, Ozrona, if we come to you, um, as Hussein was just saying before, five years ago, people thought social media was just a bit of fun, really, wasn't it? It certainly wasn't worth billions in an IPO that uh, Twitter and Facebook have had. Um, you have embraced technology with a task force and you stand in some credit Swiss. You've also taken on people from inside the tech world, from places like Google, to advise you on this. What have you been coming up with? Well, we have, what we have done, what I've actually commissioned a couple, of, a couple of years ago, was sort of a project called Future Lab. And basically, I gave them a relatively simple task. I said, well, just look at all of our business models that we currently have and think about as to what the impact would, could be of the technological development on the existence or the development of those business models. And um, you know, we came up with a lot of interesting ideas. We, we discussed philosophical questions like, if you are in a world that moves towards total transparency of information, which I think this is what we are seeing now, what's the impact on business models, right? Do you trade more or less? What do you do? What do you want then? If suddenly maybe it becomes relevant that you have somebody who can distill a lot of information to what is relevant for you, particularly for you as an individual, and so forth. So we, we looked at all of our, of, of our um, businesses in a fairly granular way, and this was done with ve all very young people uh, from all, from all uh, hierarchy levels in our company. And then, you know, with the, the results of this, uh, we then moved to a second stage and we developed sort of a prototype of a digital private bank, as I would call it, at the upbrand uh, scale, which is we are now so developing and will piloting in, in Asia in particular. So what does the digital prototype of a bank for Credit Suisse actually look like? Well, I can't tell you now. But, because but roughly, what are we talking about? But you will about? see it soon. No branches um, at all in 10 years' no, time? No, I wouldn't say that. But I mean, you think about an ultra high net worth individual uh, that has assets all over the globe. Uh, is a digital savvy investor who maybe made his money in that space, what does he want, right? You could expect him to want to be sitting in front of his iPad on his porch, being able to control over his positions globally, to trade at, at any given time, to get access to instant research, to new ideas, or push a button, talk to your relationship manager uh, somewhere on the globe at any time he wants. In other words, what that requires is you have to have a much more comprehensive uh, offering to that, uh, to that person. I, think, I don't think any bank at the moment would be able to provide that because it, what it means is harmonized platforms and so forth. And security as well. And security as well. And security means. comes on top of it. I mean, I haven't focused on that now. But obviously, that's a very important. And even in a, in a world where there is full transparency, there is a legitimate, I would say, area of uh, confidentiality that you want to keep for clients. And you know, to, in order, to be, in order to be able to deliver that, 
you have to do a lot in terms of, of also of technology spend. I mean, if you look at banks, I would say about, about a fourth of our workforce is directly or indirectly in IT, even now. And we are not, and not in the software yeah. space, but in, in, in the hardware oh, yeah. space, in technology, in, in running the systems, and in, 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 in confidentiality and security issues. Let's have another question from the audience, if I can see anybody asking any questions. Please raise your hand. I'll give you a couple of minutes. There we have one in the uh, second row, third row on the left. Thanks. Hey, how are you? Uh, this is for Hussein. Um, Hussein, I'd like to get your opinion on the uh, virtual reality world. Um, you know, uh, the hype is that, like at the E3 conference, everyone's talking about Oculus Rift and Game Face Labs and so forth. Just wanted to see what you thought from an investment point of view well, on that. So, and again, uh, this is a hard one because I think virtual reality has been around for a long time. I, I still remember the days of Vermal, VRML, which is a virtual reality markup language, which is very similar to HTML and was supposed to change the world. It was, in, it was, it was, it was basically spun out of uh, Silicon Graphics, which at the time was a, was a big company. Um, I think all of us have been kind of waiting. I think the one thing that Oculus did was, if, and if you've played with it, uh, it, it's actually quite a fundamental different experience. I think they figured out how to track the motion and actually make it actually feel a lot more immersive. Uh, you know, it was, a, it was an amazing acquisition. Uh, again, it was a small company, which goes back to this question of how big are these companies actually going to be uh, when they're at scale? I'm not so sure people all around, all, all around the world is a good thing in, in, in these days if you're trying to create value uh, for your companies, because that's cost. Um, but the question is, what are the applications going to be built on top of it? Uh, I don't think any of us know, and I think a lot of us, at least in the venture community, are looking at the folks who are much brighter than us, who are the entrepreneurs building these companies, to, uh, to come back with, with models that, that might actually be interesting and, and, and working. Uh, you know, but this is, you know, watch a movie from the 80s, right? And you will see a ton of, of virtual reality. So this is a concept that's been around for a really long time. I, I think the really hard part about our industry is figuring out when these concepts actually turn into reality in terms of actually getting mainstream use. And, and you know, we could have all sat around in the early 2000s and said the mobile web was going to turn on. And most of us made investments in 2002, 2003, 2004. And we all timed it incorrectly because it wasn't until the iPhone came out in 2006, 2007 that that market really started started taking off. And so that's the danger of, uh, of being an investor. That's why I said it's very, it's very humbling, right? Because you, you know directionally where it's going to go. You just don't really have a sense sometimes as to when the timing is going to be. And indeed, this is where the technology industry and the telecommunications industry comes in. Had Facebook launched, for instance, eight years before, well, it wouldn't, people weren't using their mobile phones no. in the same way. They weren't using your services. No, I mean, that's, that's a very good example. I would pick up what Hussein said here. Um, if you look at virtual reality, then the, the most usage that's been there, for instance, has been in the gaming, in the gaming industry. And the next big step for any gaming industry is with all the connectivity and so on. And I think then we're going to move beyond gaming. So then you're going to move into, for instance, banking experiences, which are much more holistic, entering into the bank office, even though you're not there. So we, we're going to go through a big transformation as many industries are merging. Media, gaming, all of this is coming together. And there, I think the networks are going to play the major role because otherwise it just won't really work. If you're going to experience, let's say, with wearing glasses or Google's, uh, Google glasses or some, some type of headgear or, or, or wearables in one way, um, you need a very responsive network. You need something that's very safe if you're going to really see an augmented reality experience or a virtual reality experience. So in terms of timing, where are we? We're perhaps five years away or something like that. But it, timing is everything. And the network's build out is what's going to decide part of that timing. Let's take another question from the audience. If there are any more questions coming out here. There we go. Lady in the fourth row. Thanks. Um, hello, I'm Martino Eberle, Ember Global 2005. I have a question or more, more a comment. We have been talking about innovation quite a lot and we've always heard that, you know, young people are involved in those teams and I wonder if we can limit innovation to young people. Mm. Mm. First one, yeah. For you, innovation in young people, should it only be the young I would love to say that yes. <laughs> But um, uh, frankly, you know, in, in our company, it, you will see multi-generational workforce. So there's a father and a daughter working. 
there's a father and a son working. So that's a reality. One of my colleagues is here with me today. His daughter is working for us in the same company. Uh, so what it does, it, it is very humbling. I love that uh, statement. It's very humbling because te technology or innovation does not see age, does not see experience. Uh, your idea stand stands on its own strength rather than, you know, I have 20 years of experience or, you know, Don't this you and this stuff. Don't you need the experience to temper that? This is it exactly does. what you know, so I, I was, I was, Absolutely. I was just going to add here that, you know, when you have someone who has worked for 25 years, so this, comp this just TCS itself is like a 40-year-old company. So you would have someone who has worked 39 years doing only technology, has seen computers which I can't even fathom, you know, I, from there to today from a smartphone generation. They would, we have policies and processes in place today in the company which will enable taking that experience out of someone who has spent 39 years doing technology in various shapes and forms to someone who is joining today out of school from, let's say, LBS last year, yes. right? And you know, that enablement of a dialogue and distilling of experience, we have, we have technology today that captures it. So we have, so before the smack became big or the Facebook and the Twitter became a marketplace, we had these applications in-house that we used to use at least in the last 15 years. So we have an internal social media. We have an internal knowledge management uh, system. And it caps, if, if today, very simplistically, if today someone is working on a project for Boeing, right, developing some encryption security platforms for them. There is a way that that technology and that process is captured in that knowledge management system, keeping co customer confidentiality and all that. But that learning, that reusable tool or asset that we will capture inside will be there for someone who says, let's join yeah. 10 years later and says, oh, you know, this is how this aspect of Boeing worked. Yeah. So, so I, I just maybe, maybe mm. I would have rephrase a little bit your question, if I may. I mean, it depends very much on the precise question you, you want to ask. If, you, if your question is, you know, what do you think the next generation will require from banks? In, 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 my, in, in my particular case, what, do you, what would be the experience? What would they want to see? Yeah. Obviously, it's, it's, you ask younger people because they grew up with the internet. If you want to develop a, an existing process further or you want to, want to make a next phase of, a, of, of an already innovative uh, process that you have been doing for a long time, obviously experience will count a hell of a lot. So I think the way you put together teams will hinge and to a yeah. large extent on, on the question you ask and what you want to do. And it could very well be that, you know, um, over a time of a project, when, when you get to concrete deliverables, experience will play a more significant role than at the outset when you just rethink how the world could possibly be going forward. So I, I, I think it depends on what you're actually doing. So I think if you're, there's some industries which require a long gestation period, right? So if you're a deep scientist in something, if you're a biomedical researcher, the idea of a 20-year-old or a 19-year-old being able to disrupt that industry is very, it's very low because there's just a series of training and a series of learnings that you need to go through. And you're probably more well-equipped to be an entrepreneur or come up with something you know, in, your, in your 30s or your 40s or your 50s if you're, if you're a deep researcher. There are other industries where if you're a software person, you're probably, especially if you're a consumer internet person, that innovation is probably more likely to gonna, is going to come from a teenager or, or a 20-year-old because they're much closer to actually what's on the cutting edge and those platforms are not that hard to learn, and so it's easy for them to figure it out and then apply it, right? So you would see the Snapchats or the whispers or the secrets come out of a younger generation. So I think it kind of depends. I think there's some research out there that said most of the companies that are formed, about 80% of them are formed by people under the age of 40. And that's mostly because the time that you can actually take on the risk, you don't actually think that much about your future because you can bear the risk, is in your 20s and the 30s. And so I think there's always going to be a bias towards youth, just simply because that's probably at a time and an inflection point in your career where you can you can take on very big or you know or very big new new future risks. Especially in certain sectors. Now we're out of time, and I'm sure that a lot of you are desperate for a cup of coffee. So I'm going to wrap things up by asking each of our panelists in extremely brief words, if they can, what they think about generation tech and its impact on the global economy. In a nutshell, what they expect from it going forward. Starting out with you, Hussein. 
So I think we're going to see we're going to see more and more more and more consumer more and more interesting applications built on top of these platforms. The one thing that we I don't think we've talked about in the panel is I, I worry about the rising income inequality uh, both both in the U.S. and in the U.K. as well as globally. And I, I think to, to in many in many ways I think tech amplifies it uh, mostly because I don't think I don't think tech is a create a net creator of jobs. I think it's a net destructor, especially if it's very efficient tech. Yeah. Oh. Generation tech, obviously, on top of the network platforms, we're going to see up to 5 billion smartphone users in the next five years. Tremendous innovation. On the point of innovation, it's the mix. It's the mix of generations working on this. It's so that within Ericsson, we use people who's worked 30 years with technology and people who's worked a couple of years or just months on the technology to really get the most out of what we do. Uh, very diverse uh, world. Uh, it's very important to be able to address all those. Oh. All right, Fazana, quickly. Knowledge and education. I think technology will be able to uh, connect uh, people and help them realize the potential in terms, you know, today you have Khan Academy, you have Stanford, and LBS, everything online you can study and you can, you know, really educate yourself any part of the world. Um, I agree with the, uh, you know, income inequalities, but I think that is going to be bridged because people today, whether it's in the interiors of India, are very aware that they need to know technology. So may not have road and infrastructure, but will have a Facebook account. <laughs> so I think uh, that's the reality of where we are today. Depending what your priorities <laughs> are, I suppose. And finally? I think the Generation X will, um, will uh, change, I think, all of our lives and businesses even more fundamentally going forward. And I think the curve will accelerate yeah. uh, and will encompass not just the business world, but other aspects of us as well in a much more fundamental way than we probably think now. Okay, well, I'd like to thank our panelists today. As you can see there, that is Urs Gruner from Credit Suisse. We have uh, Bazana Hack there from Tata Consultancy Services. Um, Ulf Edmondson, the Chief Technology Officer of uh, Ericsson and Hussein Kanji from Hoxton Ventures. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for sharing those views. Ladies and gentlemen, just stay where you are for just a second. <laughs> Apologies. With, there is actually apparently one uh, question that I have to ask for your views on. This is our polling question number four. Um, what is your view on sustained global economic recovery? So, is it already here? Will it be here next year? Will it be here in two to five years' time, five to ten years' time, never again, or will it have come and gone in five to ten years' time? So I'm going to ask you to vote on that and then you can have a cup of coffee <laughs> so we have a little bit of a split as you can see here roughly 35 and 34 percent think that two to five years time or it's already here well on that note i will invite you to have a cup of coffee uh, drinks and refreshments will be served in king george iii room which is next to the registration and can i ask you to leave your voting keypads on your chairs <laughs>